Today, we're going to talk about the power node in Unreal and Unity. Let's get started. I'm going to start off today's video by explaining uh, what the power node does and the math behind the power node. And once I've finished that explanation, we're going to move on to a couple of things that you can do with the power node in a shader. All right, well, let's take a look. You can see that the power node has two inputs, base and exponent. And the base value is the main value coming into the power node. And the exponent is the power that you're going to raise the main value to. If you think back to high school math, uh, when you raise something to a power, what it meant is you're taking your original number and multiplying it by itself uh, X number of times, and that X number is the exponent. So if I have a value of two coming in and I'm raising it to a power of two, which happens to be the default, you can see two right here, two multiplied by itself two times is gonna give you a value of four. So if I pass a two in, I'm gonna get a four out. Well, what happens if I pass in a value of four and raise it to a power of two? Four multiplied by itself, four is a result of 16. So if I multiply four by four, then I get 16. So uh, as the value coming in gets higher, the value going out, if I raise it to a value of two or power of two, the value coming out increases exponentially, right? Okay, and then likewise, I can also increase my exponent value. So I could take my two and multiply it by itself three times. So if I passed a value of two in and raised it to and gave it an exponent or raised it to a power of three, I would end up with a value of eight because two times two is four and then four times two again is eight. And let's take a look at the same node in Unity. In Unreal, the inputs are called base and exponent and in Unity, they're called A and B, um, but really these nodes are doing the same thing. This is the main input, A, and this is the exponent, B. So I'm taking the first value and multiplying it by itself the number of times uh, of the second value. Okay, so I know that a lot of you are visual, so let's take a look at a graph to see exactly how this works. So this is a website called Desmos, and it has a really nice graphing calculator function that I'm gonna use to show you visually what it looks like when you use the power node or when you raise a value to a power. So my first formula over here is x to the power of k. So we're taking a value of x and raising it k number of times. And in Desmos, x is a value that just increases linearly uh, over time. And so that's what we're looking at here. Um, just by default, uh, my x value uh, increases. And uh, we can see that um, illustrated by this line that just goes straight up and to the right. And you can see that right now my k value is 1, which means... I'm multiplying it by itself one time, which means it's just giving uh, itself as the value. So uh, this math is doing nothing, basically. It's just displaying x as my curve. Now, as I increase the number of k, you can see that my curve begins to curve upward. And if as I get k to a value of 2, now I have a nice curve. You can see that uh, this is curving up and it's increasing exponentially. And if I increase K to a value of three, now we call this, it's cubed, uh, a value of two we, call, two, we call it squared, and a value of three, we call it cubed. So now the curve is significantly steeper. As my X value increases linearly, my K value uh, increases at a much steeper rate because I'm raising it to the power of K. 
All right, well, what I actually want to show you is what happens when we zoom in. So I'm going to zoom in here and just look at the square that is in the range of 0 to 1, because this is the most common way that we use the power node on values that range from 0 to 1. And so I'm just going to change the range here so that we start down here in the bottom left at 0, and then uh, over on the right side and the top, we're going to a value of 1, 1. And you can see that the value here in this corner uh, is 1, 1. So let's go back to uh, an exponent of 1. And we can see that, again, our line is linear. Um, but as we increase our power, what we're ending up with is a curve that starts at 0 and intersects this 1, 1 point and it's as if the curve is pinned in those locations. And the higher my exponent gets, the more curvy this line is, <laughs> but it's still pinned at 0, 0, and 1, 1. So it's maintaining those two points on the graph. And the higher that I get it, um, the, more, the more this line becomes curved, um, but it's still maintaining those two spots. And that property of the power node is what we use uh, in shaders. So I can give my, uh, my power node a value that's somewhere between 0 and 1. And when I apply the power, it's going to create this curve. So uh, let's take a look again. If we're at a value of 1, 1, if I give my power node a value of, let's say, 0.5, which is right here on the curve, you can see that this curve is gonna bring the value of 0.5 down significantly, and I'm gonna end up with uh, a value of like 0.2, say. And so um, even though I start out at zero and end up at one, the midpoint is gonna be uh, significantly lower, so it's gonna take longer to get to that midpoint um, but then it's going to increase quickly. And what we can do with this property of power uh, is increase contrast. And so when I show examples, I'm going to show you how the power node can change the contrast of a mask value or a color value or a texture value. Uh, and that's a really valuable property to have. Likewise, as our curve, uh, as our power value goes below one, you can see that our curve goes in the opposite direction. And so instead of a curve that starts out slow and ends up fast, we start out really fast and end up slow. So you can see that my, my power value here is 0 0.3. And the further below one I go, the sharper I start out and the slower I end up. So we can remap values using the power node and increase or decrease the contrast of a color, a value, or an image um, to adjust the fall off uh, either with a slow in or a slow out curve. It's pretty cool. Okay, let's jump back into Unreal and Unity and take a look at a couple of examples of how we can use uh, this nice curving property of our power node. In this first example, I'm going to show you how you can use the power node to increase or decrease the contrast of a value, a color, or an image. Let's start out with a value. Here I've got a value of 0.5, and I'm just going to wire it directly into my base color node. And you can see how uh, my color comes through, and it's applied to my, uh, my preview cube here, and it looks kind of gray. So right now I'm just passing my 0.5 value straight through. Actually, this might show up a little bit better if I come over here and set this to unlit. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'm just going to pass my 0.5 value into my power node and then pass the result of power into base color. Right now my exponent is set to 1. So using the power node this way is basically doing nothing. I'm raising my value of 0.5 to a power of 1, which will give me a result of 0 
All right, if I increase my power, if I come over here to constant exponent, if I increase my power to two, now I'm gonna end up with a gray value that is darker. Um, because if you remember uh, when we looked at the curve in Desmos, my curve is being flattened and slow at the beginning and then rising quickly. So my value of 0.5, as I said before, is being pushed down. So the higher I raise my power, the lower my value of 0 0.5 is going to go. So point, or so value of four drives it darker, value of eight drives it even darker. And if we go higher, pretty soon we're gonna start uh, getting close to uh, a value of zero for my value of, of 0 0.5. And then as my values get closer to one, as my input value gets closer to one, it's gonna rush up quickly uh, to meet the one value. Okay, so I've applied this uh, power curve to my value of 0 0.5, and it's pulled it down significantly. Let's try the same thing with a color. Here I've got color of gray. It might be more interesting if we set this to, I don't know, maybe a purple or blue kind of color there. Okay, so let's pass this into our power node. And you can see, again, it's darkening it significantly. Let's change our exponent back to one. And you can see that I get a purple value, but then the higher my exponent goes, the darker my purpley value is going to get. Okay, and it also goes the other way. So if I set the power node to a power of 0 0.5, now my purpley value is gonna get brighter as we um, as our curve expands upward instead of downward. When you're using the power node, it's always really useful to keep in mind that curve. And remember that the higher the exponent goes above one, the more the curve is gonna start out slow and then speed up at the end. And uh, when we go below one uh, to a value of like 0.3 or 0.4, the curve is going to curve out and bow up the opposite direction, and so we're reducing the contrast. Okay, well, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what happens with our power node uh, when we use it with a picture. So I have this uh, nice picture of a flower vase here, and let's wire this into our power node. And now I'm gonna raise it to a power of two. Did you see how uh, the darks got darker? We can still we still have these nice uh, bright yellows and pinks and reds, um, but the areas that were dark uh, got darker, and that's because our curve is bowing downward. So if we raise it to a power of three, and now it's even darker. Power of four, and as our value goes higher, all of the values that were dark just get crushed into that black area. And notice the values that were originally bright are even brighter and more saturated. So what we're doing with this power node is is basically uh, similar to a contrast operation in Photoshop where I'm increasing the contrast. Okay, let's go back to one. And if we set it to 0 0.9, now you can see that uh, the, the areas that were dark are getting brightened up. So we're reducing the contrast here. If a value of 0.8, it's even brighter a value of uh, 0.6. Can you see how it's it's getting brighter overall? There are still some dark areas here um, because our, our original value of zero is still pinned at zero like we saw on the curve. And our original value of one or the whites are still pinned uh, at one, but the values in between are curving upward and everything, uh, everything except zero and one is going to be uh, brighter. So we're uh, increasing uh, the brightness here as the exponent value goes below a value of one, in between zero and one. Okay, so this node is really, uh, it's really valuable uh, what you can do with it. There is one interesting thing that I wanna point out though, with regards to the performance of power. Let's take a look at our stats here just a minute. Normally, I recommend that you not use uh, instruction count as 
a way to judge the performance of your shader because it's not very accurate. Uh, and I'll explain why in a future video. There are a lot of details there that I need to explain. Um, but what I want to show you here, and I'm just going to move this texture out of the way. What I want to show you here is that sometimes it's better to not use the power node because when you use, um, when you raise an object to some arbitrary power, there's some fairly complex math that has to happen. And it, it can be just a little bit expensive. Um, so if you know you want to raise something to a power of two, for example, let's set this to a power of two. Notice down here, our base pass shader is 153 instructions. Let's set this to a power of two. And did you notice how our shader dropped to 151 instructions just there? We we, we still have the same shader nodes. Why did it suddenly become cheaper? Well, under the hood, uh, the, the shader compiler is doing an optimization. It knows that we're using a hard-coded value of two. And so what it has done under the hood is it's replaced this power node here with an operation that just looks like this. So we're taking our original value, multiplying it by itself, and passing that in. Now, the thing about graphics hardware is that it's really fast at doing multiplies. <laughs> and that's interesting. It's dropped down to uh, 149 instructions now. And that kind, of, that, that kind of gets to the point of what I'm trying to say. Sometimes the power node can be more expensive than doing the same thing in another way. So here, I'm multiplying my image by itself, and that is the same result as raising to a power of two, but I've gotten fewer instructions here, 149, uh, compared with 151 when I get this, when I do the same thing with a power node. So it's a little bit more expensive, you can see, uh, to raise to a power of two than simply to multiply the image by itself. All right, if I want to raise to a power of four, I can take this multiply and add another one. And now I've got 150 instructions. So you can see each of these is one instruction. So I've raised to a power of four, whereas if I use the power node and raise it to a power of four, now you can see 152. So if I know I want to use a hard-coded power of two or a power of three, how would I do a power of three? Let's, let's take a look at that. For example, I could use this and then multiply by the original value again, and that would raise it to a power of three, right? So uh, if I know that I want to use a hard-coded power of two, power of three, power of four, I can just use multiply and it ends up being slightly cheaper than if I use the power node itself. Um, usually when you have a power node, you wanna, you wanna raise it to some arbitrary value. And in that case, it's fine uh, to use the power node. But there are these cases where you want to uh, increase the contrast uh, to a specific hard-coded amount. And in those cases, uh, it's better to use multiply. Uh, but those are kind of edge cases. Uh, I just thought it was important to point out um, that the power node itself can be a little bit more expensive than using multiply. Graphics hardware is really fast at doing uh, multiplies, um, but the formula to compute a power is a little bit more complicated. And so you should use power when you want to use some arbitrary value. And you should use uh, multiplying by itself when you know you have a hard-coded uh, value. All right, so here we are in Unity, and I wanted to show you that the same thing applies here. I've got my power node, and I've got my texture wired in to the A input port, and I have my value here wired into the B input port. So this is my exponent here, and this is my texture coming in. Uh, with a value of one, I'm just gonna get the image itself, but if I raise it to a power of two, now you can see that 
Uh, just like in Unreal, I'm increasing the contrast. And if I go below, uh, I, I up the brightness so the contrast is reduced. And so that's working just the same as it did in Unreal. In this next example, I'm going to show you how we can use the power node to control the results of a mask that we're generating. Here I've got the view direction and the normal vector, and I'm passing those into the dot product. And basically what this is doing is it's measuring the angle or how much, uh, how the object is pointing toward the camera. So wherever the surface of my object is pointing at the camera, I'm going to get a value of white and wherever it's pointing perpendicular or away from the camera, I'm going to get a value of black. That's what the dot product of the view direction and the normal vector is doing. So you can see I'm passing the result of that into my base color and my emission. And basically what I've, what I've got here is a Fresnel term, right? So it's going to be white as the model faces the camera and dark as the model faces perpendicular to the camera. But my Fresnel term is not very pronounced. You can see that it's kind of dark around the edges, but not as much as I would like. And so what I can do is use my power node to adjust the results of my mask. So I'm gonna take uh, the output of my dot product and wire it into the A socket of my power, and then wire that into my base color and emission. Now with a float value of one passed in, as we said, this is just gonna give me the same result as I always have. But the magic happens when I start to increase the, the value of the exponent. So here I've got uh, raised to a power of three, raised to a power of four. You can see that as I increase this value, I'm pulling those darks that were uh, really isolated right along the edge and pulling them out and moving them in toward the middle. So I'm able to adjust the results of this mask to get more of the effect that I'm looking for um, as a result of raising them to uh, a higher value, a, a power of five or a power of six. Now, just like I showed you a minute ago, remember that the power node uh, can be a little bit more expensive. And if I know exactly what the value is that I want to to raise, especially if it's a whole number like two or three, I can just use uh, multiply by itself uh, to get the similar kind of result. Uh, and it's a little bit cheaper to do it that way. But if I want to use an arbitrary value, for example, if I wanted to expose my exponent value here as something that the user could tweak and adjust in the material, then I definitely would need to use the power node and and it, it, it would just be a, a little bit more expensive, and that's just fine. Um, but you can see here how I've used the power node to create a little bit better result uh, from my dot of the view direction and normal vector. I've, I've created something that is more interesting. So you can use the power node to adjust the results of your masks. And this could be any kind of mask. It could be uh, distance from the camera mask. Uh, it could be a directional mask, a uh, fall-off mask. Uh, here I'm using a Fresnel mask, um, but you can use the power node to adjust the output of your mask uh, to get closer to the results that you're looking for. There is one last example that I wanna show you uh, for how to use the power node. And this one has to do with approximating gamma correction. Let's take a look at our texture here for a minute. I'm gonna switch over to our flower vase texture. And you can see that there's this checkbox over here called sRGB. Whenever we have a texture that represents the color of the object, the diffuse or the albedo texture, this sRGB checkbox needs to be on. And that's because gamma correction needs to be applied to any data that represents color. Uh, there's a long explanation uh, that uh, kind of needs to be given to explain what gamma is. Uh, and I don't want to go into that now, but maybe I'll put a link down in the description to something that describes it better than I could. Um, but basically, color needs to be adjusted to compensate for uh, the gamma correction that the monitor is doing. 
data that represents masks or normals needs to not have this gamma correction applied because it's just pure data. Um, but textures that represent the color of the object need uh, this gamma uh, correction applied. So that means we're checking this sRGB box uh, so that that's the case. Now there are some cases where uh, you may need to use a linear texture or a non-gamma corrected texture to represent color in your material. And there are other cases where you have a texture that is gamma corrected like this one and you need to adjust it so that it represents linear data. Well, one uh, really kind of a shortcut to use to, to make those adjustments is with a power node. So if I have data that's in linear mode and I need to convert it to compensate for gamma, I can raise that data to a power of 2.2 .2, uh, and then pass that in. And what you'll see is this data well, actually, this isn't a very good example because this data actually already has the gamma applied to it. And so now I'm applying it to it twice. I do want to show you that if you have linear data, you can adjust it and use it as color by uh, passing it through a power of 2.2. And in similar fashion, if you have data that is already in sRGB mode or gamma correct, uh, and you need to use it uh, together with linear data, you can make that adjustment if you pass it into your power node and raise it to a power of 0.45. So a power of 2.2 converts linear data to sRGB and a power of 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.45 converts sRGB data to linear. Now, like I said, this is just a shortcut or an approximation. If you need absolutely precise and perfectly accurate numbers, uh, you, you want to use a little bit more complex formula. The, the conversion from linear to gamma and from gamma, gamma to linear is a little bit more complex than just uh, raised to a power of 2.2 or a power of 0 0.45. But this is a decent and fast way of approximating it. So you can use the power node to make this conversion if you need to. All right, well, that about wraps up today's tutorial. I hope you've learned some things about using the power node and raising your data to an exponent. And I hope this, uh, I hope this video was helpful for you. Next week, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier in the video that it there's a lot of explanation that goes into explaining why instruction count is not an accurate way of judging performance. Well, next week I'm going to get into those details and we're going to talk about uh, ways of measuring performance in your shader and why instruction count uh, is not very accurate in giving you a good measurement of what your shader's performance is going to be. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. I hope you come back next week for that one. And in the meantime, have a great week, everybody, and we'll see you in the next video.